Welcome to the BJC Podcast as we continue our special series on Christian nationalism. I'm Amanda Tyler, your host for this series, and I also serve as Executive Director of BJC, which has for more than 80 years been defending faith, freedom for all. In light of conversations we've been having about Christian nationalism, we thought it would be a good time for us to step back and take a broader view of our work in the church-state landscape. We want to look at the challenges to our constitutional commitment to religious liberty for all people, which includes the institutional separation of church and state. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by three esteemed colleagues for this broader conversation. Each of them has extensive experience teaching about religion and the Constitution. First, Holly Holman is here. Holly serves as BJC's General Counsel and Associate Executive Director. Holly provides legal analysis of church-state issues that arise before Congress, the courts, and administrative agencies. She provides strategic leadership for BJC's amicus brief efforts, including more than 20 briefs filed at the U.S. Supreme Court during her tenure. She most recently led BJC's involvement in the Bladensburg Cross case, and you can learn more about that on our website at bjconline.org slash crosscase. Holly, welcome back to the BJC podcast. Nice to be here. Thanks. We also have Rabbi Ambassador David Saperstein, who is the Director Emeritus of and now Senior Advisor to the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, or as it's more commonly known, the RAC. It represents the Reform Jewish movement to Congress and the administration. Rabbi Saperstein also served as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, carrying out his responsibilities as the country's chief dap- carrying out his responsibilities as the country's chief diplomat on religious freedom issues. David, thanks for joining us. Mm-hmm. And finally, we have Melissa Rogers, who also wears a lot of hats. She's visiting professor at Wake Forest University Divinity School, and she is a non-resident senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings. From 2013 to 2017, she served as executive director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Melissa is also the author of an upcoming book, Faith in American Public Life, which will be published next month. You can pre-order Melissa's book now on Amazon, and we'll post a link to that page in the show notes. She also served as executive director of the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life and general counsel of BJC. Melissa, thanks for being here. Great to be with you, Amanda. So as we get started, all four of us are attorneys, and we're all dedicated to the cause of religious liberty for all. In addition to our independent work in this area, we've also spent a lot of time working together on these issues, and we're keenly aware of just how difficult these church-state disputes can be, and we know that there are good faith differences on how people come at these problems. So since we're having this conversation in the context of our podcast series on Christian nationalism, I want to note right up front that a disagreement on the proper application of the First Amendment's religion clauses is not necessarily evidence of Christian nationalism. Sometimes it can be, but it's not always. And this is a really complex area of the law, and you are all experienced teachers of the law here, and we can address the current challenges in church, state, and the role of religion and public life. So on this series, we've been looking at definitions of Christian nationalism. And I think that getting a common understanding of what that term means is important before we dive in. This podcast series is a companion piece to a statement available online at christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org. It's a statement of unifying principles that anyone who identifies as a Christian is welcome to sign on to. And that statement sets out this definition of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism seeks to merge Christian and American identities, distorting both the Christian faith and America's constitutional democracy. Christian nationalism demands Christianity be privileged by the state and implies that to be a good American, one must be Christian. It often overlaps with and provides cover for white supremacy and racial subjugation. So before we get started, I just wanted to put that definition out there and see what you all think about that definition and what, if anything, you might add to it. 
Well, I think it's great to uh, set that forward and then to think about, as we will do together in just a moment, how the Constitution is structured to provide religious freedom for all and institutionalize the separation of church and state. And those serves as bulwarks against any form of religious nationalism, including Christian nationalism. And they counsel against, indeed prohibit, preferences for one faith over another. So it's a great opportunity for us to think about how this marvelous constitution that we have serves as a bulwark against preferences for one faith or another. And it reminds us that that is a precious guarantee and has been key to the success of our country. And we need to not take that for granted, especially now, and understand it and defend it. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, let me just begin for a moment just to acknowledge what I hope everyone who listens to this podcast is aware of, and that is uh, amongst many of the national religious denominations and religious organizations working in this field, I think it's universally agreed that uh, Baptist Joint Committee is first amongst equals in the extraordinary work it does for religious freedom and for separation of church and state. Um, and to really uphold the, found, the, the vision of our founders in enshrining those ideas in the First Amendment. Um, so I'm really delighted to uh, be here in that context. Um, I, I, I think as I listen to the definition, as Melissa said, I think it really captures it. I, based on this idea, this belief that this country was created as a Christian country, Christian nationalism argues that the government of the United States has not only the right but the obligation to affirm the religious identity of this country, to do it through its laws and its policies and the messages that it sends out, however it may treat um, other religions um, in theory, that that stamp of approval is the essential character of what America is about and suggests that if there is a tension or conflict between the religious beliefs of an individual or a group with the secular law of the land, including the Constitution, that the secular law and the Constitution has to be changed in order to affirm um, uh, the, that sense of the Christian religious values that are at the core of America. Radically different notion than that which was embodied in the First Amendment, as Melissa um, just asserted, and we'll have a chance to um, develop what exactly what those differences are and what the implications are. Yeah, well, and I think we can get right into it to put that. You've both put that legal context, that frame around Christian nationalism. And so as we get started for our listeners, uh, I thought it'd be helpful to have a quick overview of just what those legal protections are in the First Amendment. And so, Holly, can you kind of give our listeners a thumbnail sketch sure. of that? Sure. So you find wide agreement among all Americans that religious liberty is important, that it's fundamental. But to stop and think about what it means um, requires us to look at our, our charter and our founding documents. And for all lawyers, we start with Article 6 of the Constitution, which is the no religious test for office clause. So it, it, it enshrines this idea that our elected officials are bound by the Constitution, not by any religious test. So there in our in our charter, it's clear in Article 6. And so that's a quick answer to those who, who would think that the founders wanted to set up a religious nation to say, well, it's a curious way to do that, to have in Article 6 this no religious test for office. And then, of course, we have the religious liberty clauses of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And so those provisions are kind of where we start. Of course, there are other constitutional provisions and other laws that also protect religious freedom. But that gives us a place to begin and answer the question, how do we protect religious liberty and what kind of country are we with regard to religion? Well, thanks for that reminder and that frame. You know, you've all been at this work for a long time. And I hope you'll correct me if you don't see this the same way I do, but I think we have much more confusion about what religious liberty or what religious freedom even mean than we did 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so what are the biggest misconceptions that you see surrounding religious freedom conversations today? 
Well, one is, um, and this has happened for a long time, is that some people say that religion has been kicked out of the public square. That's simply not true. Uh, in fact, the Constitution protects the rights of religious institutions and individuals just it protects others' rights to speak out, to be engaged with their elected leaders, um, to take stands on policy issues, to file briefs in the Supreme Court, as Holly was just uh, uh, discussing. So it's very important for people to understand a basic rule of thumb, I think, is that while government-backed religion is prohibited by the Constitution, uh, the Constitution also protects the rights of religious institutions and individuals to express their faith, including in the public square. So that's one thing that I think we clarify right away. Um, and unfortunately, that area has often been mischaracterized and misunderstood. Another one would be uh, that government-backed religion is good for the religion that receives the government's endorsement. <laughs> right. We hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah. And when you think about it, it's kind of curious because sometimes you'll hear people say that who don't want government. They think government messes up everything, but yet they want it to promote religion and think that will be good for religion, um, so which is a strange position to hold. Uh, government-backed religion not only will inevitably discriminate against minority phase and we may think we may say and even intend that it won't but it will end up being that way when the government sponsors a prayer uh, it will tend to sponsor the majority prayer when government funds religious activities if it does um, that then it will end up funding the majority activities but what's important to remember is that not only is that harm there but it also harms the faith that receives the government's endorsement so how does that happen the government tends to, when it sort of sponsors prayers in the public school, for example, it will tend to um, magnify elements of the faith that agree with the state's agenda and minimize or even suppress elements of a religious prophetic voice that do not agree, that actually may criticize the state's agenda. So what you end up with over time is a funhouse mirror version of faith rather than authentic version of faith. And when the state is using its microphone to propound that funhouse mirror version of the faith, then the authentic version of the faith has a hard time breaking through and holding the state accountable to the better angels of our nature, as Abraham Lincoln so so wisely said. So it's very important to remember that there are dangers, not just for minority religions, but also for the faith that the government would endorse when it does get behind and promote a particular religion. And mm -hmm. Melissa, these problems are, as I was listening to you talk, they are so persistent and they come from different angles, right? When you talk about the misperception that religion is not welcome in the public square and you think about God being kicked out of the public schools, you know, going back to the 60s, that's been a refrain. And it, you hear it um, propounded by different sides. It, it's just a, a kind of confusion about religion and the proper place of religion in public life and what our sort of founding principles are. So this is a great um, opportunity to revisit those and question those. Right. I think some other misimpressions are in the other direction, that separation of church and state means that government and religion can't work together and partner. They can. And <laughs> Melissa was yeah. really at the core in the Obama administration of creating ways within the constitutional um, uh, constraints uh, so that government would remain neutral on religion but could be a powerful partner uh, and each with, with the other in uh, develop in providing social services, education, a whole range of social goods uh, together. So that's one um, also. Another one would be that separation of church and state kind of equally constrains state and religion. And it's really the Constitution's wording Congress shall make no law. <laughs> it, the basic constraint is on the state. Religious individuals, religious groups have exactly the same rights as everyone else. They have the same freedom of speech, the same freedom of association, the same freedom of press, the same freedom to petition the government for redress of grievances that other groups have as well. The major constraint on religion is it can't take on governmental authority um, uh, here. And that brings us back to your warning, which is an old one about government manipulating religion and infringing on religious integrity and autonomy when you link them together. Some of the greatest abuses of religion throughout history, think of the Inquisition 
or today blasphemy laws, apostasy laws, um, have come when state power is used to impose one set of religions on other and punish those who disagree with those uh, uh, those religious beliefs. One of the greatnesses of America was precisely separating um, uh, church and state, and that protection of religion has allowed religion to flourish in America with a diversity and strength unmatched anywhere um, in the democratic world today, matched only by India, but far more people going regularly to worship, believing in God, holding religious values central in in their lives, um, precisely because of the wall that keeps government uh, out of religion, that in the name of religion, we would tear down that wall and revisit some of the horrors of the past um, would is one of the great ironies of the debate at this moment in our history and the, and, the, and the assertion that the Christian nationalists are making. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought in that international context. So much of our conversation today is going to be focused on our experience in this country, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity that have you here, Ambassador Saperstein, and to talk about your view on the international world. I wonder what sort of impact you see religious nationalism having around the world. Um, be it Christian or another religion, and how what that impact is. Well, that linkage of state and religion I talked about um, has meant that the states often will throw their weight behind a particular religious interpretation. If that particular religious interpretation it embraces is an extremist interpretation of religion, then you have government coercive power behind it, and it leads to enormous abuses. Um, uh, conversely, uh, you know, there are other uh, restrictions on religious freedom that come from states that are secular states that don't like religion and deny the fundamental freedom of religion that America has put forward to, uh, uh, to the world here. Uh, so this is a global issue. Just to make the point to tie together several things that we said, that prohibition against no test for religion, the promise of free exercise, and the bar against establishment of religion created in the United States for the first time in human history a nation that would be based on the proposition that your rights as a citizen would not depend upon your religious identity, practices, or belief. Now, like many of our rights, we didn't get there in, in the beginning. There were state establishments that went on um, uh, for decades. But in the 1940s, in, uh, the, the Supreme Court began to robustly interpret the religion clauses um, and create the schema that we're talking about here, this, that we think reflects where the founders, re, what the founders really intended and applied it to contemporary times. It was exactly the time the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights would evolve over the next decade, drawing on America's ideas. And our dear uh, idea of religious freedom is exactly the one that is embodied in those international uh, documents. And the fact that our nation today is leading the the nations of the world in fighting for religious freedom. And this is something that links together us across the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, should really be a source of pride for us. We're making the argument that all people everywhere, no matter what their religion, have the same religious freedom rights as anyone else. Yeah. And I think it's important that we know <laughs> that our protection of these wonderful ideals, the laws that we have to protect it, are only as good as we as a society can protect them. And so a group of religious leaders saw a threat to that religious leader and that to that religious liberty, and that threat comes in the form of rising Christian nationalism. So got together this group, Christians Against Christian Nationalism, put out a statement of unifying principles that is um, meant to be a consensus document, something that People can uh, associate themselves with these unifying principles. There's a, a list of uh, seven points here. Uh, they are you know, relatively short, I think deceptively simple, uh, because behind these few words are years and years of case law and conversations trying to work this out, you know, a couple of centuries of work of trying to live up to our ideals and our found, founding documents. And I did. I thought this would be a great opportunity to have three scholars of constitutional law sitting around the table to really break down a few of these statements and to to find out kind of what is behind some of these. So I'm going to take three and ask each of you to kind of lead us off and have a conversation about them. Uh, Melissa, if, if we could start with you, given your experience, 
uh, working with the administration, uh, with other institutions, and your recent book on religion and public life. Uh, the first statement on Christians Against Christian Nationalism is people of all faiths and none have the right and responsibility to engage constructively in the public square. Right. So, you know, as we were talking earlier, people who are religious uh, of all faiths and none uh, have, and people who are Americans can engage with equal rights with the in the political square if it's on public policy or more broadly just public issues and that right is protected and the Supreme Court has said that repeatedly so that's something that people uh, need to know it's what role should religion play beyond having that equal voice and opportunity is something that's informed not just by the Constitution, but also by our traditions and our, our wonderful thinkers um, like Martin Luther King, who famously said that the church is not the master or the servant of the state, but the conscience of the state. And I think that is consistent with our, our constitutional ideals when he said, look, you know, the, the, the religious community should shouldn't be giving orders to the state. It also should not be, you know, receiving orders um, from the secular state, uh, but it should be the conscience of the state. And that is a solemn responsibility. And we see it time and time again. I can give a historical example, which will not surprise you, having mentioned Martin Luther King, but the, the struggle for, obviously, for racial equality that we continue to need to work on. Uh, as you discussed in your opening, Amanda, um, that is one time in which we saw the religious community, most prominently, of course, the African-American church, uh, come to the fore and call the nation, say, we are a voice of conscience. We need to live up to the promise that we have not realized in this nation for racial equality. Then I think of another time when um, recently the uh, people of I think almost all faiths have come together to say that this family separation policy at the border when children were being torn away from their parents uh, as as they crossed the border at undocumented people. And what we saw, I, I remember one protest in particular um, that happened right on government property using that equal right to speak out of women of faith saying that we must end this immoral policy of family separation and saying it on government property. That is an excellent example of religion's role in public life and the highest use of our religious voice in this nation, and, I think. And really, Melissa, it's something that can't happen very effectively if these forces are joined together. If people can't see that the distinction, that separation, um, then it would have much less force. But everyone can look at these at these women, these people who speak out, um, and as you said in the civil rights movement, see that as these they're not beholden to government. They're mm -hmm. not combined. They are using their moral force, the religious and other arguments to hold government accountable. And that separation allows that to happen. Right, it, and it's interesting because both the separation and the equal access principle right. saying that religious groups can uh, sign up to use public property right. on the same basis as any other group. And religious groups congregate on the um, the National Mall uh, frequently to hold protests and observances, even to you know practice their faith very publicly there. So it's another example of religion playing a very important role in the public square as a member of this uh, nation's moral fabric and also the, the advantage and the importance of preserving church-state separation so that religious people can speak in a critical way when necessary to the state. Thank you. Uh, David, I wonder if you will kind of lead us in breaking down another one of these principles sure. here. Uh, the statement says, government should not prefer one religion over another or religion over non-religion. What does that mean? Uh, again, that the core principle of the religious clauses of the Constitution mandates government neutrality to religion. We can't endorse religion, support religion, favor religion. It can't harm religion, interfere with religion. Government has to be neutral. 
And in a country that sociologists tell us we have as many as 2,000 religions, denominations, and sects, probably the most religiously diverse nation in the world, it's a good thing not to have government deciding whose prayer will be said in this context, who will get government money and who won't, who will be endorsed by the government and who won't. Um, as a Republican-appointed uh, judge, uh, Sandra Day, all kind of pointed out, when you do that, you tell everyone who doesn't get it um, uh, here, they're outsiders. They're second-class citizens. Um, uh, here. Whatever the law says, that's the message that the government is is giving. So it's not surprising. You look at uh, John Paul Stevens. You look at uh, Justice Souter, Republican-appointed judges who embrace this idea um, of neutrality, that the government um, can't treat religion over differently than non-religion can treat one religion within a re- uh, uh, within the religious realm more favorably, less favorably than uh, any other religion. It's really worked well to keep the strong common wheel of America together. Um, and the last thing we need is to find this nation um, divided into the kind of religious strife that has torn so many other nations apart precisely because people were made to to feel like second-class citizens and outsiders, not favored, disfavored um, by the government. It's interesting, um, David, rem- reminding us of um, Justice O'Connor and Justice Souter, and we're looking for this now. Um, some of these principles uh, are always there, but they're not always in fashion or talked about a lot. And um, this principle that you were talking about, you know, Justice Scalia was kind of soft on as far as promoting um, religion over irreligion, as he called it, mm-hmm. I believe, as long as it was sort of a majoritarian kind of monotheism. monotheism. That's right. As long as you can get the Christians yeah. and Jews and Muslims together, that that's that's most of the uh, people. And so he was his view was a little bit different. But even in this last um, Supreme Court case where we saw the, how, how the court was really divided in the religious display case about the cross on public land, in dissent, I'm sorry, in the majority that was all fractured, Justice Kavanaugh underscored that line. And I was really glad to hear him say this, that, to point out this principle that we are all equally American, no matter what religion they are, or or if they have no religion at all. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a challenge for many Christians um, to to be reminded of that and to stand up across well, that, the board. And that gets us to the religion, the Christian nationalism issue um, uh, here. Clearly, there are those who say you can favor one religion over another. Um, that is such a small number of the Supreme Court justices, even conservatives, Republican appointees, Democratic appointees. So Justice Rehnquist, who may also not have liked the religion versus non-religion, made absolutely clear it's a bedrock principle. You can't favor one religion, uh, prefer one religion over uh, another religion. That idea of neutrality was at the core. That's the right. fact today we are so diverse with growing numbers of people, numbers of people who feel no religious identity, and that doesn't mean they don't believe in God and aren't spiritually questing, but they don't connect with a particular religious group at certain points in their life, means that this principle of treating non-religion and religion is more important than ever before in the history of our country. And I'm glad that these justices, Republicans and um, Democrats, foresaw that in setting core principles that live today um, as powerfully as they ever did, and in all of them an absolute repudiation of core principles of that Christian nationalists argue in uh, America ought to be about. And, you know, uh, uh, tying this together a little even more, uh, for a person to say that the government should not favor one religion, my religion, over another religion, does not mean that a person has to say that all religions are the same, that, you know, we, we just, we, we're, we're not, go- we're just going to say whatever religion is fine, there's no exclusive truth in my tradition even. That's not what the statement is about. It's not what one has to buy into to endorse the statement of no preference for one religion over another. It has to do with, David was mentioning the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human dignity. It is about human dignity that we give everyone the treatment that um, that that we would want for ourselves, the golden rule too, um, so that we recognize that each person has 
infinite worth and equal value and should be able to follow the judgment of their heart and mind. And that fits in with our own, you know, Christian tradition that says we want people to respond as our as our dear James Dunn always said to, uh, to God voluntarily. We want it is that volitional act that makes our faith so meaningful. So we never want to have pressure on that act. Uh, much less from the government. So it's it's also a mistake to say that you you can only really endorse this non you know this non preference principle if you believe all religions are the same. That is not true, and that's an important thing to clarify as well. Well, one of the exciting things we've learned about the Christians Against Christian Nationalism statement and the um, how it's attracted so many people is that there are so many Christians identifying their different denominations. And you see that diversity in those denominations for us, people who kind of work and live in religious circles, we know d- deep divisions even within Christian <laughs> life. And so, yeah. but to know that that we're not we're not saying we agree with people with all of the um, the way d- different Christians worship or what scripture they put the emphasis on or what leads their their um, political, I guess, interest in the public square, we know that there are hard fought differences. But what we're standing up together to do is to reaffirm these principles that Christianity is not something that is tied to a particular nation and that those who confuse their identities, their religious and their national identities, end up harming both this American tradition of religious freedom and their own faith. Yeah. And I I think that that point about that, you know, being politically pluralist doesn't mean you have to be religiously pluralist, right, I think is an important point to make. And I'm also struck when you were talking about it being voluntary, you know, we're, we're talking mostly in an adult context. But when you think about a particularly vulnerable group, we think about children. And so the the last statement that I really wanted to pull out and, and talk a little bit about is one that has raised some questions among people who have seen the statement. And um, so, Holly, I would want to ask you kind of to give us a little bit of explanation behind this line from the statement. Religious instruction is best left to our houses of worship, other religious institutions and families. Um, Yes. Thanks, Amanda, for pointing that out. I think the reason that I think was important to be part of this statement is we were hearing from people that um, there was a rise in certain communities of Bible bills, teach Bible in in the schools. And we all know, the three of us know that we've had these debates from time to time and that there's developed curriculum about the proper ways to teach about religion in the public schools, just as the Supreme Court made clear that there wouldn't be teacher-sponsored, school-sponsored prayer and devotional religion in school. They made clear that teaching about religion was an important part of education and that religion comes up in lots of academic um, arenas. So we know that there's a right way to teach about religion. It's also very difficult to have a Bible course or a religion course in public schools. Some people do it well and some people don't. But if there's a revival of those kinds of conversations, we wanted to say really clearly in the statement, when it comes to particular religious instruction, and you know, the Bible is not used by all religions. <laughs> Just note that up front. And so these Bible bills, these Bible in the public schools, um, efforts need to be examined very carefully. So when we say religious instruction is best left to our houses of worship and other religious institutions and family, we're not saying that there's no role for the public schools to teach about religion or religious diversity or respect. And there may be some great examples of doing it the right way very successfully. There are difficulties in getting that done. But we wanted to say that really clearly. For me, growing up in the in the South, it's just so obvious because why are there so many different Christian churches if we all believe religious instruction should be the same? I mean, we know that we count on our particular chosen voluntary um churches and synagogues that we choose to go to, that's where we go for our shaping of our religious instruction and how we do that. And it needs to be recognized as distinct from anything that the state could do. You know, I would point out again, widespread consensus on the high court that when it comes to children, questions of organizing prayer, of teaching religious truths, 
of inculcating or endorsing certain religions, that special care has to be given. Definitely. Um, to bend over backwards because kids are so impressionable and they can so easily jump to the wrong conclusions um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about this that, uh, that that wall separating church and state is even a little bit stronger mm -hmm. when applied to the real life challenges that we face in educating our children in our public schools. Um, and the court's always been consistent about the special concern not to ever coerce children directly or indirectly to participate in religious activities, to have to learn religious truths, uh, et cetera. So yes, we have spent a lot of time in the religious community and the uh, civil liberties communities trying to help teachers be trained how to teach about uh, uh, religion and to do it well. Um, at the same time, groups like BJC and uh, many other of the national denominations, including our own, have really tried to be uh, effective in ensuring that the constitutional protections will live in the school systems of America. And, you know, it's probably a good time just to mention that this group, uh, members of this group and our predecessors all worked on a statement, a joint statement of current law about religion in the public schools, talking about the protections for religious expression and the limits when it comes to government um, involvement in religion, that teaching about religion is, of course, approved. Uh, preaching religion in our public schools is not. So might be a good thing to link to um, for everyone to refresh their memory about that wonderful statement that did bring together people who have many differences about what the law should be, but were able to agree widely on a statement about what the law is in um, that the as the Supreme Court has articulated it. And I'm curious, it, 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 how the kinds of issues we're dealing with here, how do you address them? How did they affect what you were writing about in the book about religion and public life? Um, uh, well, certainly, you know, one one thing I was just thinking about as you were talking about um, teaching about religion, it's not just limited to our public schools. You know this well, David, because the State Department has to have mm -hmm. a literacy about religion. You cannot go to a country and not understand the religious facets of the landscape in which you work and do effective diplomacy. And we could take any number of examples to do that. So, um, you know, there, I talk about a lot of things in the book. Uh, one thing I talk about is, uh, you know, we, during the uh, Obama administration, when Secretary Kerry was at the, um, at the State Department, talked about that we ignore the global power of religion at our peril. If we don't understand that, we can't understand our world or our nation. So it ranges beyond the public school, this appropriate role for teaching about religion. And it, it, it sort of helps, puts more texture on this principle of separation of church and state. Doesn't mean that our government cannot or should not be religiously informed, religiously literate, literate about religious liberty is essential as well. So separation of church and state is sometimes understood in this very wooden way that government and religion can't work together on issues of shared concern. Not true. I ran an office where we did that every single day. Um, it doesn't mean that the government doesn't have to take on board the responsibility of understanding religion and how it manifests itself and the importance of understanding and protecting religious liberty as people um, promised and bound to the Constitution. The religious liberty clauses of the First Amendment are as important as any other constitutional principle that we give attention to in government, we've absolutely got to have policymakers fluent in this. And frankly, I think we got work to do there. We do not, policymakers sometimes treat this as a, an area, oh, it's a little bit strange, a little bit scary. Um, we'll touch on it every now and then, throw in a verse from sacred scripture into a speech, but we won't really think about how it applies across government. When you think about religion, it cuts across all kinds of interactions with government, whether it's education, whether it's um, health services, whether it's disaster relief with religious groups playing huge roles there. So it cuts across government in so many ways. And we have to have people within government who understand these principles and, uh, you know, uh, deploy them effectively. Uh, or else we're, we're really not living up to the Constitution's promise and requirements. Yeah, I think that's that's really part of the reason that this statement has been taking off and how it has generated a lot of excitement is because there's 
some they're, they're hearing people are hearing things that don't sound right. Mm-hmm. They don't. They, it just doesn't. It doesn't fit with what they understand our country to be. When you hear voices speaking Christian nationalist kind of terms and making assumptions about us being a Christian nation. Yeah, you know, this is sort of a call for Christians to stand and say, "Wait a minute, that's not that's not what Christianity is about, and that's not what our religious freedom principles are about." And so this statement kind of gives an opportunity to reaffirm that and kind of correct where we're going. I think that's why people are excited to say, "Let yeah, let's put our name on there. Let's have uh, some different voices show that that's not the view of religious liberty in this country, and it's not the view of Christianity that we want in the public square." Yeah. yeah. And our our idea of separation of church and state is not the only way to provide religious freedom and equality to all people. There are countries, it works for us, with our (laughs) very diverse religious uh, characteristic and our history of having created a nation to reject the linkage of church and state that was so uh, devastating um, in the countries that our our first uh, uh, American citizens had come from. Um, I hear... So, but there are countries that have established or preferred religions. There are countries that have government sponsorship of religion, um, but do embrace the principle um, uh, that the government should in, should never interfere in the religious decisions of individuals, um, and that all people have equal citizen rights in those countries. Um, the real danger has happened over and over again in countries either that embrace secularism and, do, and deny religion as a reality uh, in the life of the country at all, such as China or uh, here, or more frequently, exactly the linkage we talked about that's the core of uh, Christian nationalist expression uh, here of government with its coercive power um, embracing one religion um, as the true religion and therefore punishing or disadvantaging or disenfranchising those who feel um, uh, uh, differently in their hearts and their conscience and hear God's word and God's call to them differently than is the majority view in that uh, in that uh, particular country. When that linkage happens and people are denied their rights, equal rights as a citizens because of their religion, it's turned into a disaster and it is the last thing that we need in America. So when Christians are standing up to say um, Christian nationalism that would distort what America is about and really run us down in the direction that it's plagued so many countries of religious divisiveness and oppression, I I couldn't be happier or prouder of uh, my friends who are uh, involved in that. And for those of us who are religious minorities, it makes all the difference because I can tell you as a Jew, we have known more freedoms, more rights, more opportunities in America because of the constitutional construct and because of people like you who have given this kind of vision out than we've known anywhere else in the history of the Jewish people. I can't think of anything else to say after that. So I want to just thank all three of you for joining us for this really important conversation to have you know people with your expertise and experience in this field to really put needed texture on the issue um, to see just how nuanced uh, and complex it is, uh, but that we all have a role in standing up. So thank you for joining us. Holly Holman, Melissa Rogers, Rabbi Ambassador David Saperstein. I'm grateful for your leadership and I look forward to many more collaborations in this area. I also want to thank our listeners for joining us for today's podcast. And for the first time, I want to thank our viewers. We have a video of this conversation available on BJC's YouTube channel. Next week will be the final episode in the BJC podcast series on Christian nationalism. Our guest will be Ibu Patel, the founder of Interfaith Youth Corps and the author of Out of Many Faiths, Religious Diversity and the American Promise. Don't miss our conversation about how embracing pluralism might be one way to counter Christian nationalism. Subscribe to the BJC podcast to be notified of new episodes. And if you're new to this podcast series, you can catch up on previous episodes. The BJC podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Follow BJC on social media and let us know what you think about the podcast series. We're on Twitter and Instagram at BJC on the Hill. And you can follow me on Twitter at Amanda Tyler BJC. Tune in on Wednesday for our next episode.